And Jeff's going to talk about, um, from his side of the fence as a developer, what he needs from some of the, the technical folks that know the content well to help make this process go smoothly. So with that, Jeff, it's all yours. Thank you, Jill. I appreciate the info, and I appreciate uh, everybody who's joining us here today. Um, for just a few minutes before we kind of uh, dive into some specifics of, uh, of um, some of the other apps that the rest of the panel has, has produced, um, really want to take some time to set up um, and, and talk about the process of developing apps and what, um, what goes into that, and particularly, like Jill said, um, what do you need to do as a content provider to not only find the right developer for your project, but also um, give them the right tools to be able to produce the app um, in, a, in a successful way. So um, as Jill mentioned, um, my name is Jeff Abley. I am the founder and developer of a um, uh, small iOS development, or excuse me, small app development company out of Lincoln, Nebraska, called Move Creative. Um, we've been uh, in business for uh, a little over five years, and um, as she said, mentioned, we were one of the first um, to really kind of dive in and, and produce these um, from the uh, university or extension um, side of it. We've been fortunate enough to work with the University of Nebraska, and as well as uh, a number of other extension groups throughout the country. Um, so we're excited to, to talk about uh, some of the some of the, the tips that we do have as part of this process today. Um, the first thing I want to touch on is things you need to look for when you start the process to find a developer. Um, you know, and certainly these are the same kind of pro the same process that we go through when we're trying to find our own developers to either add to the team or if we hire them out as a uh, third-party contractor. Um, and so, I, you know, these, these have worked well in the past for us. The, the first one of these is to find somebody with app experience. And I know really the, the whole idea of, of apps hasn't even been around that long. That seems funny that, you know, there's, a, there's that many people out there that, that have much app experience. But... What we always look for when it comes to this is there, an, an app is a, a lot different from a traditional piece of software um, in that there are a, quite a few more um, steps that have to take place kind of outside just the development ecosystem in terms of getting them distributed to the right place, um, working through the, what can sometimes be a political landmine with Apple and, and Google and, and getting those in the right places, in the in the in the right stores, and so um, you know, even when we're hiring internally, this is a this is a big sticking point because we want somebody that we know understands the process, and even if that means they've developed their own apps and they've they've gone through the process um, just to try to just to try to get some items into the store, you know, we think this is vital that they understand that. Um, that system and they understand what types of certificates they need from Apple and, and all of those little intangibles. Um, the second of these is, is this developer able to do multi-platform or is your development group able to do multi-platform? You know, I, this sometimes sounds a little surprising to people because they just assume that all developers kind of can produce for, for multiple platforms and that's not always the case. There's a lot of shops out there that do just focus on iOS. There's some that just focus on Android. Um, but there are quite a few shops that can produce for both. And those are the ones that I really would encourage you um, to focus on when you're looking for someone who, to do these. Um, there's a lot of advantages to being able to develop for both platforms at the same time. Um, there's, you know, and, and including not only some of the code that can be that can be shared between some of these apps in many cases, but in some cases some of the design um, and, and those types of things. So try to find a developer that, that can do multiple platforms at the same time. The third is user experience. This is one that's a little bit more of an intangible um, and really the only way to figure out if this is the right developer when it comes to user experience is to just download as many of their apps as you can that you know that they've played a hand in. Um, and, and really, the things you should be looking for in those apps are, um, do, 
do you, when you first enter the app, does it feel like you know where to click next? That's one of the biggest ones I can always tell. You know, I know there's a lot of apps that I open from time to time um, that I, I open them and I'm just immediately kind of questioning where I need to click next. And that's not a, that's not a situation you want any of your users to be. They have very short attention span when it comes to these apps. And, um, and so, you know, that's something you have to be very careful with. But just overall, the, the user experience, you know, is, is described in a lot of different ways in terms of the overall design of the app. Do they have a good sense of, of navigation in the app, of getting back and forth, or are you constantly getting lost in it? Um, so again, these are the only things that you can really rate a, develop, a developer on by downloading um, some of the apps that they've been responsible for in the past. And then long-term support. Um, this is one of the biggest ones uh, to, to talk to your developer about because uh, unlike, um, you know, we've really gotten to a point on the traditional web where code that maybe you put out there three, four, even five years ago, um, is, if you didn't touch it during that time period, it would likely still be running, running pretty well on the site. But an app certainly is not like that. It needs a lot more maintenance um, year to year. You know, we typically, um, we typically, with every single app we do, try to touch it at least once a year with some sort of update um, when possible. And so, and that's something, you know, again, that has come with experience. We've learned, we've gotten a sense for how much work is going to go into this year to year um, to, to continue to keep these on the cutting edge. And we've figured out a way to, to really factor those into the bids and, and make sure that, that we're not only... Um, that, that we can be a good resource for the client um, for not only at launch but for years to come with this app and do it in a cost-effective way. So as you begin talking to the developers, here's a few questions you may want to think about that you could ask them. Um, number one is, and again, these are just kind of leading questions to get a sense for how they they rank on some of the, those, the, the four other things we talked about on the last slide. And number one is how do you factor long-term support into your bids? So again, this will give you a sense of if this is something they've worked on in the past or not, or if this is new to them, um, because they should have a plan for how they want to handle apps long-term. Um, and in many cases, can build that in. The second is can you build and deliver apps for both Android and iOS devices? Um, Again, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but this is something you want to get a sense for what their capabilities are. Have you worked with clients in our industry before? Can you build apps for both tablet and mobile? Um, again, that, that's one that's very similar to the Android versus iOS debate, but there's some development shops out there that don't, um, that don't develop for either tablet or mobile. Maybe they just focus on one or the other. How much of the fees do you need up front versus once the project has been complete? Again, get a sense for, are they comfortable working on this long-term project, um, it, it, you know, knowing how the pay structure might work, knowing there might be just a little bit up front and, and more um, one at launch. And then what tools do you use to provide mock-ups and demos? Um, you know, this gives you, again, a real sense for this developer and their experience um, with working on these types of projects in the past. So all of this leads to the pricing discussion. Um, and this is obviously one of the more critical pieces to have with your developer. But there's, there's a lot of different ways you could price apps and that price apps are, are priced out there in the market. Um, most of them fall into one of these two camps, either a pay per hour setup or a flat fee setup. Um, we traditionally feel more comfortable using the flat fee, flat fee cost, but I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of the advantages of, of both setups. Obviously, with the per hour setup, you don't have to have as big of uh, or as, as detailed a scope right off the bat. You don't have to have everything figured out with your app. You can just kind of get started, start building. If you need to switch midway through the project to, to some other type of thing, you can do that because you're just on an hourly basis. But the problem with this is, and, and what we find in working with a lot of university and, uh, and, and even private companies, um, is that you know, people like to have an idea of what they're getting into. They want to, they want to know what those costs are going to be beforehand. They don't want just this open-ended thing. Um, and in fact, in a lot of cases, obviously with grants, that does not work at all. So that's why we err more towards the flat fee cost. But the real downside to this is 
you have to have a very, very detailed scope right off the bat in order to get a, an accurate estimate, or excuse me, an accurate bid, um, and to, to make sure that on both ends, both the developer and the client, you're covered and that you feel comfortable heading into the project with that dollar amount. So since everything is really so dependent on the scope, I want to spend these last couple slides um, talking about the scope and what should be in it um, as you're preparing it for your developer. Um, so these are the basics. I really look at, there's about nine basics here that I think every single scope document should have. Um, number one is the platforms and devices. So be very um, explicit with, with your developer about what needs to be, uh, you know, whether you want it on iPhone only, whether you want it Android only, whether you want it on the iPad as well. And in a lot of cases, you may not know that. And so in those cases, don't be afraid to ask your developer and say, can you give me multiple estimates, one with iPhone only, one with iPhone and Android, and so you can just get a sense for, for how much that's going to be. But, but definitely, this is one of the things that affects the cost more than any other part of the project is what platform and devices you want to, uh, to take it to. The second is cost to the user. So that, that, what I mean by that is, is this a free app in the stores, or is this a, um, an in-app purchase, or is it even a, more of a flat fee type, um, type app? And so there's a lot of pros and cons with each of those. Localization and market. So um, essentially what this means is, are you looking to serve um, yeah. you know, more than just one specific language type in one specific market. So if you're planning it to be a, an English US based app, um, do you have plans in the future maybe to make it uh, span to add a Spanish component to it? Or do you plan to take it out of the US and, and, and try to sell it in Germany and need to add German localization? And so um, those are the kinds of things, even if right off the bat you're not going to launch with those, if you can give your developer a sense that this is something um, that you're thinking about adding, they can certainly build that in, and um, they can set up their architecture so that on down the road it'll be cheaper and more cost-effective for you to add those localizations. The fourth is cloud versus device storage. So this goes back to how much of the, the data and the information on the, on the phone or device needs, needs to just exist only on the device versus how much needs to live on a server somewhere up in the cloud. Um, you know, these are the kinds of, of considerations that you start to think about people switching out their phones every two years. Are they going to be able to bring that data that they've entered with them from phone to phone, or are they going to have to do some sort of export and re-import into it? Um, but again, there's pros and cons, but with, the cl with making it more cloud-heavy, there's a lot of additional costs that can come with that. But this is a discussion you need to have up front versus later. The fifth one is stats and analytics. Um, this is one, certainly in the early days as we were, we were developing apps, um, you know, we didn't put as much emphasis on as we do now. But, you know, we, we really understand and, and try to help our clients understand that whatever sorts of information you want to get out of the app, you need to make sure you're asking right off the bat. So if you want to know how many times this page has been clicked on or if you want to know how many times uh, the, certain search terms have been, have been done inside the app. Um, you need to be very um, descriptive to your developer right up front that those are the things you're looking for. Don't just, um, I guess, um, assume that those are, are, are being tracked in the background because in many cases the developer is really just tracking um, how many downloads are happening and how many times they're being opened. The sixth is alerts and notifications. So this is how, many, how much interaction does the app need to have when it is closed? Are there things that the user needs to be alerted about um, when they just have the app in the background? Um, and there's a lot of cost variances that can come into play here. Seven is remote updatability. Are there pages in the app that, that you want to have access to update um, separate from a full app update? Because um, that's, how, that's how many of the updates are handled. Obviously, you, you go into your app store and, and your updates are just kind of happening behind the scenes. But in a lot of cases, obviously your apps are getting updated from the server level multiple times a day, for example. And so what are those pieces of, of your app that you need to be able to update um, periodically separate from an app update? The eighth is, is this app an original or is it based on an existing, um, existing spreadsheet, existing research, 
um, again, provide that as much information as you can to the developer so that they understand, you know, how much, um, you know, are, are they going to have to invest a lot of time in, in, in helping um, conduct some of this research in some cases? Are they going to have to, um, and, and, and just some of the nuances there. So be upfront about that. Number nine is key deadlines. Um, again, if you have a certain uh, show that you need this done for, is there a certain growing season that you would like it out for, um, be upfront about what those ultimate goals are for you. And then kind of the flip side of all this is what we call just the user story um, that we, we feel is a very vital part of the scope. And what this really is is this is, this is what the um, – this is essentially telling us what is your app really doing. Um, you know, we like to approach it, and I know it sounds a little hokey, but we honestly try to encourage people when they're writing about when they first get started on their scope, write write as if you're telling it first person. So actually use the sentence as a user. When I open this app, I will be able to, and for example, maybe in this case, I will be able to um, track my manure sales. Um, across, uh, you know, various time periods. When I first open the app, I will see um, two buttons there. One will be to enter a new manure sale. One will be to see my historical manure sales. And then when I click on that first button, I will be taken to a page where I can record the date, record my sales. So, again, be very um, descriptive with how you're doing it and as well as conversational. And when, what we've seen is, when clients can provide this kind of information, those are the projects that end up turning out the best. And then also do that exercise from the flip side. So as an administrator, as an administrator, I'll be able to view how many, how many people um, have, have clicked on button one, for example, or how many people have entered a manure sale. After logging into the password protected web portal, I'll be able to get stats on um, the total sales that have passed through the system or whatever that is, be very descriptive. And then the last thing I wanted to touch on today before we get into some of the app demos is the process. Uh, just a quick overview. Um, you know, there's really, it comes down to five steps as far as we view it. Number one is the scope and contract, which we've already talked about. Two is the mock-up of the app. So typically what will happen at this stage is your developer will provide you with, uh, in some cases, just PDFs that are just flat images of here's what page one will look like, here's what page two will look like, that kind of setup. But there are cases where they can provide you with something that you can actually download on your phone that is, that is essentially flat images, but they can put little fake buttons over it, and it gives you a sense of how um, that you'll flow through the app. And we've had good success with that. The third is beta testing. Um, this is one that always surprises people because it, it seems like it should be something that's easier than what it is. But um, with, with Apple and the way that they handle uh, their app store, they're very careful about who can even download test devices or test apps. And so um, they want to make sure people are, are running separate from their app store. Um, so there's certainly some considerations there with how you get those test apps onto uh, everybody's devices. And then obviously you launch it. And then the final step is marketing. Um, and, you know, that in and of itself could be a whole whole separate webinar, um, and certainly so we won't get into much of that today, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that go into that in terms of um, just making sure you're doing some of the simple stuff, like, like making sure there's at least five app reviews all the time in, in the store for each of your apps. Um, you know, that's the kind of stuff that often gets overlooked, and then, you know, so we, we certainly work with our clients to try to, try to do that.